Cool. Okay, so good evening, everybody. I'm Alex Shaw from the School of Computer Science, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth and final talk in the 2021 Gibbons Lecture Series. So as you've probably seen with the uh, technical uh, hurdles over the last couple of minutes, tonight's talk is going to be formatted slightly differently to the last few, as our speaker is currently located in Singapore. So we'll be streaming his talk live, and then he will join us uh, remotely over Zoom for the end of the talk to do the uh, usual Q&A. We'll be passing out microphones to handle that part. And then after the talk and after the Q&A, he will also be joining us live for the mix and mingle in a slightly unorthodox fashion using a, a telepresence robot, which we can see down the front there, which I think is a great example of the topic of this Gibbons lecture series. So the subject of this year's lecture series is dissolving the interface between humans and computers and examining the technologies that connect humans and computers together. So tonight's speaker will be talking about a selection of these new technologies that he has developed and how they can provide augmentation to the people using them. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Associate Professor Suranga Naniakara, who's not currently visible up there, but will be in a minute or so. Uh, he's the head of the Augmented Human Lab at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. He joined us here at Auckland back in 2018 when he was invited by the New Zealand government to relocate his entire lab to Auckland as the first appointee of the New Zealand government's Strategic Entrepreneurial Universities Program. I hope I've got that right. Uh, prior to his time here, he was an associate professor at Singapore University of Technology and Design. So Saranga has had a very prestigious career with both national and international research awards, including our rather local University of Auckland Research Excellence Medal last year in 2020. So Saranga's talk tonight will be on the topic of the design and development of novel human computer interfaces that seamlessly integrate with a user's mind, body, and behavior, providing enhanced perception and interaction methods that blur the boundaries between people and machines, which he calls assistive augmentations. So he'll be presenting a variety of proof of concept assistive augmentations uh, focused on assistive technologies novel input strategies, smart health and well-being, and interactive learning technologies. So please allow me to welcome to the digital stage, Associate Professor Suranga Nanayakara. Thank you for that introduction. Let me begin with showing you this image. These are our sensors. In other words, these are our biological interface to perceive the world. This is how we get information to interact with the world around us. However, sometimes with permanent impairments or sometimes with situational impairments, these interfaces get blocked, gets damaged. And then we find it very difficult to perceive the world and even accomplish simplest of tasks, such as going from one place to, to another or seeing the information. There are people who are born gifted. When you have difficulty in, in one interface, they found ways to use the other interfaces to compensate for the lack and still able to perceive the world and accomplish tasks as if they had no problems with this set of interfaces. This is one example. This is Ben Underwood, who's blind, yet able to function as a sighted person. I'm going to show you a short video of Ben Underwood. Ben Underwood is blind. Both eyes were removed when he was three, leaving him with no vision at all. 
So how on earth does Ben do this? And this? And even this? I don't think I've ever come across somebody like Ben. I, I, you know, he is quite unique. Ben lost his eyes to cancer, but unbelievably, he's taught himself to see with sound. So isn't it amazing that how he use his ear to see the world? This is another example, Evelyn Glenny, who was who is uh, profoundly deaf. She she became profoundly deaf in, when she was twelve, but she's able to hear the sound through her body and became a world-renowned musician. Here is a performance of her singing. Evelyn and Ben are gifted. They have such amazing ability to, to control and use these biological interfaces in an extraordinary ways to accomplish. But not every one of us are as gifted as Ben or Evelyn. So here is a wearable device that we designed, most beats, which converts music into vibration. So someone who's not as gifted as Evelyn could feel the music through the body and experience music. So this, in this particular case, this 13-year-old profoundly deaf boy is able to perceive the music through his body and then play a rhythm on his own. So this is what we are doing at the Augmented Human Lab. Designing new type of intelligent human computer interfaces extends, complements our biological interfaces and enhance our way of perceiving the world and, and enhance our cognitive capabilities. And we are not limited to designing interfaces for people with disabilities. Sometimes these intelligent human computer interfaces could support a lack of one sense, but at the same time, we, we have the opportunity to create new interfaces, new augmentations to create possibilities that are not possible with the regular use of these biological interfaces. So I'm going to go through a few examples from the lab to show you some of these uh, case studies we have done. Let me start with IC, which is an intelligent bone conduction headphone that allows a person to point at something and ask a question and get the information through audio. It has a camera and a bone conduction headset and processing communication. So when somebody is pointing at something, the camera sees the, sees the location of, of the person is pointing at, extract that region of interest, convert that into text, and then convert that into audio and the person hear them through the bone conduction headphones without getting the, the ears flow. So with this, a blind person can walk into a store, buy the product that he or she would like without having to depend on other people. And that's just one use case. Here is a short video that shows the latest version of this IC. Okay, so if I pointed at something, like let's see what if it can read this. It's come a long way, but they believe they can make it even better. Honey, squeeze me. Amazing. Poems in the waiting room. It's exactly what it is. So how important is technology like the finger reader for the blind? Incredibly important. It's bringing technology innovations into the mainstream for them. We really thank them with our heart to say thank you for doing this because what it's actually doing is um, making life uh, one of choice for them. This innovative technology that's now being worked on in New Zealand is not just helping people to see, 
a trial in Singapore is looking at helping children with dyslexia read. The team's also hoping it can be used as a translator. My hope is it will really become a, a device that blind people use on a daily basis. So Daniel, you haven't tried the finger reader yet? No, I haven't, but I'm quite intrigued to see what it's all about. So Daniel, seeing is believing. Pop that on your head. And then what you do is you put this on your index finger. There is a magazine about seafood. <laughs> That's quite amazing. It sort of goes through and lists off all the sort of top headlines and stuff like that. Coming to a cafe or a restaurant can be a bit of an issue. Oh, definitely. If I could just sort of point at a, at a menu and it reads out to me. So this has other use case assessment. Here is one of the earlier prototype of the device where we use it to show that you can use it to capture beautiful textures and colors from nature and bring them as digital paint into smart devices. This is one example. The second example is gym soles. It's a smart insole that you can slot into, into your shoe. And what it does is it understands your center of pressure. And when you do full body exercises, such as squats or deadlifting, it provides that center of pressure location through vibration. So with this, a person who's novice is able to understand where the center of pressure is and adjust it accordingly so that the, the posture, the correct posture is used when exercising. We in fact ran control studies with professional trainers and these noise users and tracked their motion and posture. And we, we showed that with the feedback from the, the smart insole and some visual feedback, the novice users had a posture that is more similar to these trainers rather than when there was no feedback. Here's a short video of that device. We present Gym Souls Plus Plus, an extended reality approach to improve the body posture when performing squats and deadlifts. We develop a flexible wearable insole with eight vibrotactile motors that provides haptic feedback on the center pressure of the body. Additionally, we developed a visual feedback system by using Google Glasses. It has shown that translating hidden information on the center of pressure back into reality can assist users in maintaining a correct body posture when performing squats and deadlifts. Here's another proof of concept project, Prospero. The idea here is we want to support people to train with their perspective memory, and rather than triggering memory training program at a random interval or just a predefined time, we wanted to explore how can we understand the person's actual cognitive load through heart rate variability, through skin conductance, and find those opportunistic moments where you can trigger the memory training and the person is more likely to, to accept that. So this is a experiment around that and we indeed find found that the people were more receptive to to start the program when it was presented at these opportunistic moments a conversational memory coach that uses physiological signals to suggest training sessions during relaxed or idle moments prompto guides the application of an effective memory technique called the when then technique through a dialogue based interface with 21 older adults, we evaluated users' receptivity to prompts for starting memory practice during low and high cognitive load states. We found that users were more receptive under low cognitive load. Here's another project, chewing. This is a smart chewing gum-like prototype that you can put in your mouth and interact with your tongue and the motion in the mouth. So this is useful when you need hands-free, eyes-free interaction. For example, if you're riding a bike, someone calls you, how do you answer? Or maybe in a more serious scenario, 
if you're in a wheelchair and if you're paralyzed your upper body and the lower body, how do you control the wheelchair? The, the more state-of-the-art technology is about giving you this mechanical joystick that you use your face to control. But with an interface like Chewit, you can look at the direction that you want to go, maybe bite on the, the device or maybe roll it to control the wheelchair. Here is a video of how Chewit works. By using hands-free input operations, you will be able to shuffle through your playlist while riding. The club is new. He said, let's get out of this town, drive out of the city. Also, it can help you during your office work. Or presenting your projects to an audience. Chewit aims to unveil novel users' interactions, allowing more intuitive hands-free operations. So let me show you a couple of other projects where we try to create new type of sensations. In this project M here, we try to use off-the-shelf cosmetics with ferromagnetic properties, apply them on your skin, the skin hair, and try to just move those skin hair only. And that creates a completely different type of sensation that's more connected to affection, affective touch. And we also built a wearable version where you can control these, these uh, motions in a, in a predefined way. So as you can see in this video, the magnets, it's a combination of permanent magnets and electromagnets. And we can control these electromagnetic fields to move the permanent magnet. And as it moves, this thing moves and create that sensation. Here's another project where we try to combine smart materials, in this case, shape memory alloys, combine them with fabrics and explore the kind of sensations you can create. In this case, we ex experimented with different sizes and different uh, arrangements of these uh, shape memory alloy integrated fabrics. And finally, we created a matrix of three by five on the forearm and experimented what kind of sensation of touches we can create. And we found we can create about eight different sensations, such as somebody stroking down, tapping on your hand. So this is uh, how it works. We present Phantom Touch, a wearable forearm augmentation that enables the recreation of natural touch sensation by applying shear forces mm. onto the skin. Our approach consists of lightweight and stretchable 3 by 3 centimeters plasters that are arranged in a matrix onto the skin. Individual plasters were embedded with lines of shape memory alloy wires to control shear forces. Our design is informed by a series of studies investigating the perceptibility of different sizes of the plasters, different distances of plasters on the arm and different plaster attachment types on the skin. The plaster arrangement in the form of an individually attached matrix enables the illusion of a phantom touch, for instance, feeling one's wrist being grabbed or the arm being stroked. We also evaluated a silicone pad based sleeve that yields a higher wearing comfort with a more practical plaster setup. Our study participants rated the elusive touch sensations to be very close to real touch, and it was slightly lower with the silicone pad based arm sleeve. So I'll show you a bit of the old project, one of my PhD project, which is an interface that allows people to feel music through the body. It's augmentation of a 
regular flow in chair, that chair, that vibrates with music. So when people were sitting on this, the, the different parts of the body could pick up the sound. And similar to the, the example that earlier I gave earlier, Evelyn Pliny had that ability, but haptic chair provides that ability to those who are not as gifted as, as Evelyn. And the other thing is, in this particular project, it was more beyond, it was way beyond than the collecting data of the data. And this was, as you can see, 2009 published work. And even as we speak, 12 years later, still being used in a residential deaf school in Sri Lanka. And then, a few years later, we wanted to make a variable version of this, and that gave birth to MOSFETS project. It has two parts, a sensor and a display. The sensor bit can be placed near a sound source. It can pick up sound either from a surface, from air, or you can connect a digital input. It processes the sound, send the information real time to the display bit that has light and vibration. And these are, uh, these are connected peer to peer. So that means you can just plug in and they're ready to go. And it's a, almost a plug and play device. We experimented this in the same school. And this is uh, the same example that I showed earlier, where we started doing basic things such as beat counting, and things like increasing volume. So here you can focus on the, the student on the, the right hand side and look at his facial expressions as the volume goes up. And I should also note that all these kids are profoundly deaf from the birth. And this is the, the rhythm recreation. When we hear, we play, we hear, we adjust. In this case, this guy play, feel, and adjust. Doesn't matter which sense the information comes to. He's also able to accomplish the task. So now let me show you one of the, the currently ongoing project, Curious, which is Curious with a K. This is about enabling kids to perceive the invisible things around them, such as what's UV light, what's my heart rate, what's the humidity in there, what are the, how many particle counts are around. So by doing this, you can empower them to conduct curiosity-driven experiments. We build a set of sensors and a digital platform that allows kids to share the, these experiments with others and get feedback like peer review and collaborate with each other, very much like do science, like a scientist, and also a whole bunch of professional development materials for teachers, such as lesson examples, videos, development workshops. So together, this really create a new science experience, allowing kids to perceive the world in a different way. And all these things are tagged to the, the, the New Zealand curriculum, the nature of science part. And not only that, this is apart from publishing in a, in a research paper, this is going into a national pilot. As we speak, we are deploying over 10,000 sensors across New Zealand. We are already done with deploying this in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and yesterday in Tauranga. And these yellow pieces are the ones that yet to be distributed. We will do that through an online webinar and then post the, the sensor boxes to these schools. So it is creating a, a significant social impact. And also we are running science studies around this. We are running a, a data, data collection to investigate the impact of this in terms of changing the views about science among the kids. So these are just a small collection of number of projects happening in the lab. If you are keen, you can go to www.ahlab.org, see all these projects and send us any feedback you may have. So let me also touch upon what are the, some of the outcomes from this work. You may have noticed all of these projects have been 
published in some of the top venues. So that's an obvious science outcome we had over the last four years. We have published over 60 papers. We have done a number of disclosures, demonstrations, some startup companies, as well as we have received significant amount of awards and recognition. That's just one dimension. And we managed to establish collaborations with research labs, organizations, as well as industry. Also, we were lucky enough to be featured in a number of international media, including Times Magazine, Wired Magazine, Discovery, Smithsonian, so, so forth and so on and so forth. And as I said, a number of different awards including one for public good in 2019. But for me, the most important part, the, the real driving factor for doing what we do is really the, the impact, the social impact that we are making. As I said, the curious project is, we believe is going to change the way science is taught and learned. That's a huge impact, which will transform a whole generation of critical thinkers. And also, interfaces like Moosebit. We gave it to a lady in Hamilton two years ago, and it wasn't for a purpose of you know, just collecting data for the sake of a paper. The deal was use it and tell us genuinely how you feel. And she sent, sends us the diary notes time to time, and this is one of them. And her handwriting, her note, says it all, the impact of the device, that impact of the device had on her life. Yeah, so that's really the, the, the main outcome that we, you know, that gives us that energy to, to keep on going. So just to summarize, as I mentioned, what we do in the lab is creating new man-machine interfaces. What we want to do is we want to complement, augment, and enhance this our senses, our biological interface to this world so that we can create new perceptual, new cognitive capabilities. There are various things we need to consider as we develop these assistive augmentations. In one side, we need to think of the integration. How do we design so that it, it becomes part of our body or our behavior? Now, hide the technology as much as possible and maintain the, the natural behavior. That's, that's one aspect. Another aspect is we don't want the technology to, to control us. We want to have our agency. To do that, we need to understand the user, not just understand the user pressing a button or these explicit interactions. We also want to understand how users feel, the intentions and the context. These are very notoriously difficult things to do, but it is important to do, try and do them because if you do that, then you can provide the right information, the right interaction at the right time, maintaining the use agency. We feel that we are in control rather than technology taking over us. So the third piece is these things should be created. These assistive augmentations should be designed with a purpose, not just for the sake of designing new cool things. The purpose either could be to strengthen an ability or to create new type of capabilities. So I showed you several examples and the concept of assistive augmentation, but I guess this is just a, just a glimpse of and starting point of a whole new generation of work. And there are a lot of things to critically think about and a lot of very complex, complex issue to address, such as we need to think beyond functionality. For example, I see maybe that the user might go to a supermarket 10 minutes, 20 minutes a week. What does it do during the other time? If you don't think about this, it becomes an extra liability, extra burden. So, and, and it's not just the, the functionality, maybe the look and feel, the design aspect. A lot of things to think about, not just the, the functionality. And what about acceptance and trust? You know, things that are optional, such as ride sharing or even staying in a strangest place to where the entities are accepted and, and used by people. 
although they are optional, when it comes to critical things such as a device for a blind person or a deaf person, it's much harder to get user acceptance and trust, although these things are trying to solve a critical feature. So we need to understand how we get the acceptance. Maybe it's just, it's, it's more than the, the device, the technology, maybe it's a whole ecosystem of, of services, supports, and communities. And what about the backward compatibility? I don't know how many of you could recall 10 important phone numbers if your phone, you know, uh, phone dies, right? So that maybe the, the impact of these things we, we create when they don't work, when they collapse, we can't let the whole system collapse, right? So we need to design these things with backward compatibility in mind when they don't work, at least we should be in a stage that, that we are we work and be able to operate. And last but certainly most importantly, what about the, the ethical and safety issues? With these augmentations, we are providing an opportunity not just hack into machines, but rather hack into people and the safety aspects. So these are really, really important things to consider. And as you can see in this picture, just a collection of smart devices without a good thought process, a collective approach, is just not going to work. They're not going to add up and make things smarter. So we need to critically think of these things as we develop the next generation of assistive augmentations. And on the brighter side, if we do this, there are a lot of opportunities that they will open up. For example, they will open up the opportunity for us to stay tuned when we have so much information flying around, properly designed assistive augmentations can make us stay tuned to what we need to. They may enable us to stay connected in a more meaningful way, in a more human way, rather than you know, distracted by the devices and technology. Maybe they'll enable us to be stay focused. You know, you can go offline in a chat, but how can you go offline in real life? Maybe these technologies will allow us to, to go offline and, and stay focused on our work. And maybe these assistive augmentations will open up possibilities to experience the world that we never have experienced before. So there are things to, to look forward to. So I hope I have given you a summary of what we do and some of the critical things that we need to think of as a community. And I need to provide this final word of thank to this whole team. They are the ones who have created most of this work. My postdocs, PhD students, researchers, interns, collectively they have worked day and night to create all these new interfaces, the impact and the knowledge. So the credit goes to them and I think some of them are in the audience and perhaps after this lecture, during the, the networking time, you may want to approach them and ask questions. I'm happy to take questions through Zoom, as well as there is a physical presence of me through a robot, which will also be around during the networking session. So I hope to answer your questions and, and have some interactions through my digital presence. Thank you. Good. Great. Okay. So we'll take questions and uh, Saranga will provide answers now. Um, so in order to get the audio to go through, we will need to bring you a microphone if you've got a question.
Yeah, but there's a couple of us with microphones, so ask away. Um, so it's actually two questions that are related to the same topic. So the question is, that, what are some of the limitations in the materials that you encountered while developing the, those devices? And how do you envision new materials to further improve the assistive augmentation? Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah okay, we so can hear you. <clears throat> so there are two ways there we think about this. Uh, sometimes what we do is we push the limits of existing technology. You know, in, in for example, in Phantom Touch, we use existing off-the-shelf shape memory alloy wires to show that the potential of uh, what we can achieve when we integrate them with fabrics. So that is to also inspire the the people who are in the smart material development side to you know think of you know uh, think of overcoming some of the, the issues that we have seen in terms of uh, better integration uh, having more more flexible wires how do we you know make sure that they can be fed into uh, you know machines that can uh, that can be incorporated into the weaving process so that's one approach we take the second approach we take is we try to collaborate with with experts ourselves, so that you know we can jointly come up with with uh, the technology that is needed to make something into into something practical. So so it's, it's yeah. So sometimes yeah, as I said, it's about either just make do with what we have to show the potential and hope somebody will create the the needed technology, or sometimes it's uh, us work collaborating and working together with with other researchers to. To complete the whole circle. So a lot, yeah. a lot of these uh, technologies seem somewhat indirect. It's uh, kind of almost if you think about a computer peripheral, it's as if you connected the microphone to the computer by having it type stuff on a keyboard um, to give it the sound levels. When do you think um, we might have, uh, as opposed to just plugging it into the bus, right? Um, so when do you think we might have um, good enough direct connections into the brain to remove that indirection? And once that indirection is removed, what remains for these sorts of assistive technologies? Hmm, that's a that's a great question. It's it's very difficult to predict these timelines and future. But what we couldn't do is we could look at some of the transformation in the recent past and then extrapolate from there. So, for example, if you look at the the Apple Vision video in 1987, the Knowledge Navigator, where they show these voice interfaces and and uh, smart agents getting stuff done, it looked magical at that point. But 20 years down the road, we have them as mainstream. So that's probably the only way to maybe make a projection, uh, the, the, the timelines. But uh, the, I mean, apart from that, it's, it's very difficult to give an exact timeline when this thing will become uh, you know, mainstream because it, it indeed has several dimensions, as I mentioned, not just the, the technology readiness, that's one aspect, but also, you know, there'll be a lot of other issues to, to overcome, uh, such as the, those ethical issues, the acceptance. And, and uh, in the recent past, one of the examples is, if you recall, the Google Glasses came as a B2C uh, accessory, but never sustained and had to go back and, and re-strategize. And, and now it operates at a B2B, sta B2B stage because one of the main concerns was, although the technology was ready, there was a huge concerns about the privacy and acceptance. So there'll be lots of dimensions to overcome. It's very hard to predict exactly when we will have these things in in reality. I think maybe the the uh, the, the more important thing to think about is how can we really address all the critical issues before jumping into making them mainstream.
Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, we hear, you know, the words like research, experts, technology, so forth. Um, but I'd just like to ask, I mean, people that, the people you're assisting have deficiencies. So certainly they themselves probably have some idea what it is that might help them or, you know, like in the music thing, um, you know, what, and, you know, following the question someone asked about, uh, this guy asked about make the limitations and so forth. To what extent do you actually, and how necessary is it to consult with the users, potential users? Oh, absolutely. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer of not imposing technology uh, on people and pretty much almost everything we have done, it's a extremely user-centered process because uh, you know the users themselves are the experts in terms of what they could do, what are the specific challenges, rather than we speculate in the lab, or oh, if we did this, this is what's going to happen, rather than taking that approach. What we do uh, in real life is, let's say, if I take the IC for an example, it's been around now more than six years and, and lots of iterations. We Initially, we had this idea, okay, what if you had the camera on the finger? We brought it to users and used that as a prompt to get feedback. And based on these discussions, we understood, okay, there are more things that some of these people could do. So we should pick up on that. For example, when you do the, the, the feedback via audio, you can actually play that audio at a much higher rate. Sometimes it may not be even uh, uh, comprehend to us, but some of these blind people, they're so used to have the, the screen reader voice rate at a high high speed. So you can leverage on, on not only their uh, uh, difficulties, but also you can leverage on their capabilities. So 100% agree, we, we need to have them not just in a linear process, but almost as a circular process. You work with them, identify something, develop something, go back to them, see if it works. And maybe some parts work, some parts doesn't work. Go back and, and, and it's a never ending loop and you can improve slightly at any given time. And what you don't want to do is, is to just ask them what you need because then you are putting them, it's almost like asking a patient what kind of medication you need. But instead what you want to do is to work with them and observe and, and understand what they can do, where they have challenges, and then build things, let them try, figure out what works, what doesn't work, and then uh, you know keep on iterating. And, and then with the time and with the iterations, uh, the, the overall performance or overall usage for the user will become uh, higher and higher. So yeah, yeah totally agree. We should never just design something in the lab and, and hope that it will work for, for people out there. Okay. Thanks, Saranga. Um, just exploring that point further, I'm interested in the creativity of the inventor versus the creativity of the user. Do you, do you ever find that the user's interpreted in a completely different way than perhaps you had envisaged and in, in fact suggest other other uses of these technologies that you that you that you had not conceived as the initial inventor great question i can probably give you two examples one of them was uh, the phantom touch. We didn't design it for a specific user, but we put it out then. We thought it is going to create new, uh, new way of creating a sensation of touch. But we received an email from a researcher who saw a completely different usage for her, which is, she's a, she's a neuroscientist in Germany. She's, she thought this will be very useful research apparatus for me to do some uh, scientific studies in terms of uh, different age group groups and and uh, perceptibility so which is we, we never designed that as a research apparatus but a, a, a person reached out with a completely different use case that's one example uh, 
and then in the curious project especially when you deal with children they are almost always surprise you so we gave this bunch of sensors and we had a specific use case you know you need to take measurements and and uh, give it, give details about what were you measuring and then record them and share with others and the kind of usage they have had uh, in terms of uh, going beyond the, the protocol uh, one of them recently sent us a uh, email saying that oh i wanted to hack this whole since i i uh, loaded my own python program i created my raspberry pi uh, computer i completely i used this as a data logger uh, with some plants i wanted to measure the the humidity levels and the plant growth and the, the, our sensor as it did not support, but he, he completely revamped that and use it in a, in a completely different way. Uh, those are two examples of users using it in a very different way than we envision and still you know, uh, getting a value out of it. Um. In terms of your technology, which is used to help people do things that they can't, when, for example, I look at something, I immediately understand what I'm looking at, and I can read and you know, immediately translate in my mind what that means. Do you foresee for these people who are using these technologies that there might be some technological you know, hurdles which are insurmountable to reaching that experience for these people? So, for example, in the um, the finger reader appliance, right? If someone's pointing at something and they have to wait, and this it might be a kind of a laggy experience for them, do you foresee that that might have a change, or is that you know at some point going kind to of be able to reach like a like a like a my my own experience, right? When I can just see something and understand it immediately. Oh, great question. So, our uh experiments we haven't seen that that ideal level that we uh, we hope uh, to achieve but i have seen some clear evidences from other researchers for example there is a neuroscientist in stanford david eagleman he has shown uh, examples where uh, he created this uh, vest that converts sounds into haptics and he showed this example where He's talking to a deaf person, and as he speaks, the deaf person writes what's been spoken on a whiteboard. It's so almost like that, that subconscious perception of how we perceive speech through ears. That guy is able to perceive through his skin and, and interpret immediately. So, and and he, he, he also backs up that ability with lots of uh, uh, brain images showing that the, the auditory cortex get, get, uh, gets activated. So, so those are real hard evidence that that it is possible, and also some work by the the MIT uh, uh, Media Lab Huher, also showing that you can create these uh, interfaces, neural pathways, and and all you need to is to, to recreate that that signal in the neuron, right? And then it'll take to the brain, and and rest of the the pipeline is there. So I think it's possible. We personally haven't been able to get to that level so far, but I certainly think it's possible. Time for one more question. So, uh, Mike, give it to you. Um, particularly when it's experimental, uh, when you deploy the technologies and the accuracy of the technologies, do the users, are the users comfortable? Like, do they see that like they can use this immediately or does the user need to adjust in some way or compensate for the limitations of the experimental technologies so uh, it is it is not a you know a, certainly different from uh, buying a product off the shelf what we do is you know we build a rapport with the users and then we it's it's a more of a, a continuous engagement with the user. We never present things as finished product 
or, or this is going to solve all your problems. We rather go into a dialogue with the user and, and what we end up often doing is building a repo and, and it's, it's a joint effort. The user provides the user user's expertise. We provide our expertise and together we want to solve the problem. Therefore, there's a lot more uh, acceptance towards, you know, there, are, there will be issues and, and, and for us, understand those issues is important. So these early adapters who build a repo with us understand these, these have a lot of limitations and they, they, are, they are, in some sense, they're doing a favor to us by trying this out and figuring out what works, what doesn't work, because that feedback is the, the part that's so valuable to us to eventually uh, improve things towards uh, readiness. And, and some of them actually use it longer than needed because they, they do see the parts that they work. And then they, while, I mean, as long as you understand the limitations and, and what works, what doesn't work, by choice, they, they continue to use it longer than uh, what we need, needed for the, for the data part. Right, so it looks like we've just hit seven o'clock. So would everyone please join me once again in thanking our speaker for tonight. And as a reminder, Saranga will still be with us during the networking session via his wonderful telepresence robot, which might have some difficulty with the stairs, but I think we'll get it out there one way or another. Uh, thank you, everyone.